in the Gospel of Luke 22, we're noting now our Lord's uh, trials as the suffering servant, where now he is undergoing the three trials at the hands of uh, man and really the Jewish leadership, and then there will be three more trials at the hand of man under the Roman uh, governor Pontius Pilate and also King Herod. And during this time, we see the abuse of our Lord and Savior, Jesus Christ. And today, we're going to finish up this section, uh, which uh, is in verse 63 through 65, that talks about the mocking of our Lord and Savior, Jesus Christ, and the beatings that now begin. And these will continue throughout the three trials at the hands of the Jewish leadership. And we'll also go on to the Roman trials as he is scourged and beaten uh, and abused uh, very much so at the hands of the Roman guard and the Roman soldiers, as you know. So as we read the narrative, let's go back to Luke chapter 22, and in verse 63 through 65, it says, Then the men who were holding Jesus in custody were mocking him and beating him. And they blindfolded him and were asking him, saying, Prophesy, who is the one who hit you? And they were saying many other things against him, blaspheming. So in those last two verses, verse 64 and 65, as we noted this past week in 64, as they were asking him, who pr uh, prophesy, who is the one who hit you, as he was blindfolded, they were tempting what? The deity of our Lord and Savior Jesus Christ, just as Satan tempted the deity of our Lord and Savior Jesus Christ, as he came out of the wilderness, once he was there for 40 days and 40 nights, and those three great temptations we see at the end of the 40 days. Satan was tempting him to utilize his deity to solve his human problems. These individuals are acting in the form of Satan, tempting the deity of Jesus Christ, trying to prove that he was Christ, or really in their case that he wasn't the Christ, and therefore saying, prophesy who is the one who hit you, even though he was blindfolded at that time. And as we've noted, as God as the eternal God, the creators of the heavens and the earth, Jesus Christ knew who was hitting him each and every time, and he knew that billions and billions of years ago. So the verbal abuse of our Lord continues as we now get into verse 65, and that's what we're going to focus on this uh, morning as we talk about one particular type of sin that is mentioned here uh, that they were doing against our Lord and Savior, Jesus Christ. And that one particular sin in verbal abuse is what we call blaspheming. Blaspheming the name of God, blaspheming our Lord and Savior, Jesus Christ. And what they were doing was, in fact, attacking the deity of Jesus Christ, really claiming that he was not God, but ridiculing him, mocking him, and saying, if you are the God, if you are the Christ, do this, do that, and do all kinds of other things. What we're also going to note in just a minute, that this type of mocking and blaspheming continued against our Lord, even while he was upon the cross. So I wanted to talk a little bit this morning in regard to blaspheming, what it means, and really uh, what the particular aspect of blaspheming the Holy Spirit is all about. We're going to talk about that today. But to give you definition, as we gave this past week, blaspheming is almost a transliteration from the Greek. It's blasphemeo. Basically, we see a transliteration. It means to speak evil, to speak abusively, to slander someone. We could probably say malign them as well. But it also is used when people are speaking against God, against his word, and certainly against his will and plan as well. Anything that has to do with God, when people speak evil about that, that is what we call blaspheming against God. Now, the word all by itself, as you can see, has a lesser type of uh, negativity to it, where basically when you just slander someone or anyone, you speak badly about them, you ridicule them, or you mock them and malign them. That type of slandering can be against any individual within the human race. So you can slander anybody in that realm, and that is what could be considered as blaspheming, utilizing the old uh, uh, Greek language and understanding of the word. But over time, as we have come down to our current history, when we talk about blaspheming, we're not talking about attacking other people. We're talking about attacking God, impugning the, 
the, uh, the deity of God, impugning the person of our Lord and Savior, Jesus Christ. And when we talk about blaspheming, that's what we typically think about in our day and age. And in the Bible, that too was a form of blaspheming that God spoke against many, many times and said this is something we should not have within our society. And in fact, in the ancient society of Israel, during the age of the law, remember we're no longer under the law, but during the age of the law, in Leviticus chapter 24 and verses 15 through 16, if someone blasphemed the name of God or God himself, that individual was to be stoned to death by the people, by the population, whether it be a native or an alien or a foreigner who had come into the land. If anybody came into the land of Israel and spoke against their God and the God of Abraham, Isaac, and Jacob, that individual was to be removed from the society through capital punishment. Just as the law had many capital punishment verdicts for people who were committing heinous crimes against the citizenry. So this is one that is committed against God, and, they and God said, remove that individual from your society in this way. And by doing that, what are you doing? You're cleansing the society, and you're keeping that society whole and pure for the rest of the individuals to not be tainted by the evil and the wickedness that is coming against those who speak against God. Could you imagine in our society today, <laughs> okay, how many people, okay, would be under that type of form of punishment? But again, we know that we're no longer under the law. We no longer take these things, uh, matters into our own hand. We're now under the age of grace. But that doesn't mean that blaspheming against God or slandering God and who and what he is is not a heinous sin. And again, it's certainly not a crime in our society, as we know, with freedom of speech and freedom of religion that is abused in that way but again we know that it's a heinous sin against our God and certainly our Lord and Savior Jesus Christ and it's something we should not entertain and we shouldn't put up with it either by other individuals we can speak about that speak against that and ask people not to do those types of things but when we talk about this word what's interesting about this is that Jesus Christ himself was being accused of being a blasphemer against God even though he he was God, but they accused him and really utilized that accusation against Jesus Christ to condemn him to death in their puppet court or their uh, kangaroo court. I guess that's a better way of saying it. The kangaroo court that they had going on at this particular time. And we see that in Matthew chapter 26, verse 65. And then we also see in Matthew, Mark, and Luke that these types of abuses remained against our Lord and Savior Jesus Christ all the way up to the cross. Let's go in our Bibles. Let's go to Matthew 26. Let's turn there first. And again, we've noted this overall, and uh, we're actually going to come back to this uh, probably this coming week because the next section of Luke's gospel gets into this particular topic and scene, but Luke doesn't go into a lot of the great detail that the other gospel writers do. So uh, in regard to this, because again, he didn't need to. It was already said uh, and uh, shown through these other gospels. But in Matthew chapter 26, specifically in verse 65, and let me just get there myself and uh, <coughs> we can actually back up and uh, let's see how far back do I want to go all right so I'll, I'll go back to 57 just to give us the whole narrative it says and those who had seized Jesus led him away to Caiaphas the high priest where the scribes and the elders were gathered together but Peter also was following at a distance as far as the courtyard of the high priest and entered in and sat down with the officers to see the outcome. There, we've noted that already, Peter's three denials. We've seen that in detail. Now in verse 59, now the chief priest and the whole council kept trying to obtain false testimony against Jesus in order that they might put him to death according to their law. Okay, And they did not find even, uh, did not find any even though many false witnesses came forward. But later on, two came forward and said, This man stated, I am able to destroy the temple of God and to rebuild it in three days. And again, you all know what the analogy of that was. Yes, Jesus Christ wouldn't take him three days to rebuild the temple. He could rebuild that in a second if he wanted to. He could destroy it in a second and rebuild it. He's the creator of the heavens and the earth. But why three days? It talks about him 
as the temple of God, being destroyed, and then in the grave, and then raised on the third day. But they were using this as a blasphemy against God in his place of worship called the temple. All right, That's what's in view. It says, And the high priest stood up and said to him, Do you make no answer? What is it these men are testifying against you? But Jesus kept silent, and the high priest said to him, I adjure you by the living God that you tell us whether you are the Christ, the Son of God. And what's interesting about this passage and that word adjure is that it's a unique Greek word that is only used in this passage throughout the entire New Testament. And it does mean adjure, but it means to charge you to speak under oath. And really, that also goes back to the law. In Leviticus chapter 5, verse 1, that the law told the people of Israel that anybody that is brought forward or is charged to testify in a criminal trial must testify, and they must tell the truth. Otherwise, if they do not, that person is guilty of the crime. Kind of interesting, huh? Boy, you get rid of a lot of false witnesses in our society today if we had that in our court systems too. If you're going to come forward, you have to speak. You can't keep silent in the situation. You must tell the truth. And if you're found not to tell the truth, yes, we have uh, perjury and those types of things on our books, but to be uh, uh, guilty of the crime that you were not testifying against, that takes it up a little bit more, higher, a little bit higher notch. And again, would bring out the truth even more so. All right, so in any case, I adjure you by the living God. So again, in the name of God, I am commanding you to to speak here. That's why now Jesus Christ opens up his mouth. Not that he was heeding the command of the high priest, but he knew the law and he wanted to fulfill the law. So Jesus said in, uh, in verse 64, you have said it yourself. Nevertheless, I tell you hereafter, you shall see the Son of Man sitting at the right hand of power and coming on the clouds of heaven. That talks about his ascension and also his second advent when he returns. Now in verse 65, Then the high priest tore his robe, saying, He has blasphemed. What further need do we have of witnesses? Behold, you have now heard the blaspheme. What do you think? They answered and said, He, deserves, he, he is deserving of death. And then they spat in his face and beat him on uh, with their fist, and others slapped him and said, Prophesy to us, you Christ, who is the one who hit you? So you see how Matthew goes into much more detail than what actually Luke goes into. But again, comparing Scripture with Scripture, we see how they accused Jesus Christ of blaspheming when they took the words of Jesus Christ and totally twisted them to mean something else than what he was talking about. And again, even they should have recognized that why would it take three days to rebuild the temple, okay? If he is God, the creators of the heaven and the earth, he could do it in the blink of an eye. He could destroy it and build it up. So even that, again, they weren't being honest with themselves, thinking, oh, three days, blasphemer, oh, look at this guy, oh, how can he do that? But yet, ultimately, he was talking about his own self and his resurrection. And that's what he also pointed to in verse 64. You'll see him seated at the right hand of the Father. After you do kill me, I'm going to raise and then ascend into heaven, and then I'm coming back at one point to establish the millennial reign, as we know at the end of the tribulational time period. Then as we also turn, uh, let's go to uh, Matthew 27, just turn a, a page or two. And in verses 39 through 30, uh, excuse me, 44, we see the com- continue abuse of our Lord in this verbal sense of blaspheming against him. As they accused him for blaspheming, now they are the ones that are blaspheming time and time again. And even the thieves on the cross did the same as we know. So in Matthew chapter 27, verse 39, it says, And those passing by were hurling abuse at him, passing by when he was hanging on the cross, wagging their heads and saying, You who are going to destroy the temple and rebuild it in three days, save yourself if you are the Son of God. Come down from the cross. In the same way, the chief priests also, along with the scribes and elders, were mocking him and saying, He saved others, he cannot save himself. If he is the king of Israel, let him now come down from the cross, and we shall believe in him. He trusted in God, let him deliver him now. It is. 
uh, if he takes pleasure in him. For he said, I am the Son of God. And remember that phrase, Son of God, means that you are God because, again, that was the prophecy of the Old Testament, the, the Messiah, the Anointed One, that now is in the name Christ, that means Anointed One Messiah, would be God himself and the Son of God. Now in verse 44, And the robbers also who, were, who had been crucified with him were casting the same insults at him. So again, they were all, all tempting the deity of our Lord and Savior Jesus Christ, blindfolding him who prophesied to you when we hit you, tempting his deity as Satan had tempted, but also mocking that deity at the same time uh, by doubting his deity, therefore blaspheming the person of our Lord and Savior Jesus Christ. Now as we look at the board too, we'll see later on in Luke chapter 23 verse 39 when we get to the cross scene of our Lord. It says one of the criminals who, uh, who were hang oh, yeah, hanged there was, and again in the English it says hurling abuse, but the Greek word there is blasphemeo. Again, blaspheming, hurling abuse. He was blaspheming at him saying, are you not the Christ? Save yourself and us. And again, with that phraseology, are you not the Christ? This thief wasn't like the other thief that, again, railed against this thief and said, do you not know who you're talking to here? And that's when that other thief said, Jesus, remember me when you come into your kingdom. And Jesus then gave him a promise, today you will be with me in paradise. You see, as the other thief was saying his words about the Christ and pointing to Jesus, he was doing it in faith, recognizing that's who he was. This thief, even though he's saying the words, are you not the Christ? He was saying it with doubt and disbelief and unbelief within his soul, not believing that he was the Christ. And he only wanted physical salvation. He did not want spiritual salvation through the person and work of our Lord Jesus Christ. So in any case, we see the blaspheming of our Lord beginning at the trials of the Jewish leadership, continuing all the way, and we'll see later on when the Roman guards were blaspheming against him and ridiculing and mocking him and physically and verbally beating him and abusing him. Then while he was hanging on the cross, more temptations as they continue to ridicule him time and time again. And again, that's when I always say, and you've heard me say this a million times, I can't believe the patience of our Lord. I can't believe the long suffering of the Lord. Because if that was me hanging on the cross and these idiots were saying that about me to me and doing this and I had all this power and strength, what would I do? What would you do? Okay. But he did not. Okay. He did not. And he kept his cool and he kept his composure. He trusted in the power of the Holy Spirit to sustain him throughout all this difficulty. And he knew the greater uh, good that would be uh, coming if he would remain on that cross without sinning and without getting these individuals back. And who justly deserved to be disciplined or judged for what they were doing against him. Remember, in the law, those who blaspheme God are to be what? Taken outside the city and stoned to death. Get rid of them. All these people were blaspheming our Lord and Savior, Jesus Christ. So they were deserving of the capital punishment in this case. Yet our Lord kept his composure, kept his cool because of the love that he has for each and every one of us, and he did not sin. And instead, what did he do? He took on all those sins that they were committing of blaspheming against him. And he was paying the penalty for them on the cross. So what we recognize in this scene is that the reason that they found Jesus Christ guilty in their kangaroo court was because of the blaspheming that he was doing and ultimately uh, thinking that he was blaspheming God himself in that whole scenario of destroying the temple and rebuilding it in three days. But we understand the greater understanding of what that analogy was all about talking about himself not the temple specifically but they turned it around and they specifically uh, used it in a form of trying to find him guilty because they could find nothing else against him as we just read but we also see in john chapter 10 verse 33 through 36 uh, and mark chapter 2 uh, verse 7 early on in the ministry of jesus christ we see individuals accu uh, accusing jesus christ of blaspheming and being a blasphemer because of who he said he was 
by saying that he was the Son of God, by saying that he was the Christ, and them not believing in him and in what he had said. They thought he was the one blaspheming, when in fact, because of their rejection of him, they were the ones that were truly the blasphemers. So accusing Jesus Christ of blaspheme because he asserted his messiahship was the ultimate charge which led to his crucifixion. As you know, he was never found guilty of any crime. Pilate said, I find no guilt in this guy. What do you want me to do? And they said, crucify, crucify, crucify him. You see, he was never found guilty of any crime. It's just the will of the people wanted him to be crucified. Pilate washes his hands. It's not my responsibility. It's on you guys, okay? It's all on you. And in 70 AD, it all came down on them, as we know. But ultimately, he was found uh, 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 innocent of any and all charges. But yet, they crucified him anyway because of the people's will and then the cowardice of Pilate to succumb to the will of the people. But the ultimate charge, again, we saw, and we just read that, Matthew. We see it in Mark as well. Blaspheming, uh, then, uh, as we understand the word, is the willful rejection and denial of who God is and certainly the power of God working in the lives of individuals and certainly in the life of our Lord and Savior, Jesus Christ. You see, when people are truly blaspheming, they're saying, nope, that's not it. It's not God. It's not his power. He can't do those things. They can't do this. They can't do that. There's no power. There's no strength. It's not from him. It must be from a demon. And in fact, the passage I'm going to show you upcoming is uh, just that. As Jesus Christ was out there exercising demons from the bodies of individuals who were tormenting those individuals, as Jesus Christ was doing that, the Pharisees that were watching him do that and witnessing these great miracles said, no, that's not by God. You must be from Satan. It's the power of Satan that you're doing this. And you're evil. And in fact, because they were falsely accusing Jesus of that, they were blaspheming the Lord and they were blaspheming God the Holy Spirit as well. So again, it all comes into regard to the denial of the person of God, the power of God, the Word of God, and any one of the three members of the Trinity, the Father, the Son, or the Holy Spirit. And it also has in, it, it to do in regard to the person of Jesus Christ. When we deny who Jesus Christ is. And again, you know, there's Gnostic doctrines that have been around for, you know, eons, millennium. And in fact, uh, you know, John wrote a lot of his epistles because of the influence of the Gnostic Christians, as they were calling themselves. And there were sects that have divided off through the years. Some believe that Jesus was not a man, but he was just God and really just an image of God, but not really a man. Others believe that he was a man totally and not God. And there's still that doctrine out there that he wasn't God incarnate. Both of those are false doctrines because the Word of God tells us Jesus is God. And he was a man at the same time. So you have to reconcile that, and we do through the doctrine of the hypostatic union. But when you deny the person of Jesus Christ, that he was God and man in one, and therefore he died for our sins in that hypostatic union, as it were, again, if you're denying that, you're denying the Christ. And you're denying his saving work on the cross in the payment of the penalty for your sins as well. And again, it's a form of blaspheming. As we note in uh, the Gospel of Mark, in chapter 3, in verse 28 through 30, it says, Truly I say to you, all sins shall be forgiven the sons of men, and whatever blasphemes they utter. It's interesting that we could say disparaging things against God throughout our lives. Guess what? Jesus paid for those sins. He paid for those sins. And you could call God the worst cuss word you could think about. You can rail at God. You can be angry at God. You can do all this kinds of stuff. But guess what? It's a sin, and Jesus Christ paid for that sin. But there is one that he was not able to pay for. It says, but whoever blasphemes against the Holy Spirit never has, for has forgiveness, but is guilty of an eternal sin because they were saying he has an unclean spirit. 
You see, leading up to this in both the Gospel of Matthew and the Gospel of Mark was that exercising of demons that I told you about that Jesus was performing. And as they witnessed that and they saw the power of God working through the person of our Lord and Savior Jesus Christ, they were denying it was the power of God. And they were denying, denying he had the power of God to do those things. And instead they say, he must be from Beelzebub. He must be in league with Satan. And that's why he has an unclean spirit. And you see, after they had denied Jesus Christ that he was the Son of God and had the power of the Holy Spirit working in him to do these miracles, perform the signs that all Israel was looking for from their Savior and their Messiah to perform. He was doing those things, yet they were rejecting him over and over and over again. And instead, blaspheming him, he has an unclean spirit. But the real sin there was blaspheming against the Holy Spirit, as our Lord says. Again, whoever blasphemes against the Holy Spirit never has forgiveness. So what does that mean? And that's what I want to explain uh, to you now. Some of you may know, some of you may not have a full understanding. You see, this is more than just saying, oh, the Holy Spirit's a bad guy. Okay, or the Holy Spirit can't save me, or the Holy Spirit can't do this, or the Holy Spirit's an SOB. Okay, it's none of that. Okay, those sins would be paid for. You see, blaspheming the Holy Spirit is to deny his ministry and the ministry that he has back in the day through the person and work of our Lord and Savior Jesus Christ and the ministry he continues to have today of what we call common and efficacious grace. You see, this is the great ministry of our Lord and Savior, uh, Jesus Christ, and the power of the Holy Spirit working within the world. You see, the doctrine of common grace is plain and simple. And basically, it goes like this, that God the Holy Spirit makes the gospel understandable to everyone in the world. And if anybody hears the gospel, they can understand the principles that Jesus died on the cross for their sins, and through faith in him, they will have eternal life. Every member of the human race who receives that gospel message understands that, and they understand the implications as well. You see, that's the common grace ministry of the Holy Spirit, to make that one piece of Bible doctrine understandable to everyone, and especially, and we should say, to the unbeliever, that we all started as unbelievers. And at one point in your life, somebody gave you the gospel. At that moment, the Holy Spirit made that understandable to you. And you could understand what it means. Now you have a choice. Do I believe it or do I reject it? And that's when the doctrine of efficacious grace comes into play. Because once someone says, I understand the gospel in the mentality of their soul, they could say it out loud, they could say it in their head, whatever the case. But once they understand it, now they can say, I believe it, or no, 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 can't be. I reject it. For those who say, I believe it, and, you know, based on what they recognize, Jesus died on the cross, through him I have salvation, I understand it, I believe it. Once they say that word in the mentality of their soul, I believe it, the doctrine of efficacious grace takes that faith, which is a non-meritorious act, and makes it effective for that person's salvation. That's why we can't take credit for our own salvation. You know, We never take credit for our salvation because it had nothing to do with us whatsoever. It all had to do with the power of God working in us. And all we did apply was non-meritorious faith. And again, non-meritorious faith means you have confidence in the object of what you're believing. It's got nothing to do with you at all. So God gets all the credit and God gets all the glory. But God the Holy Spirit is the one who has this ministry. He had it during the time of Jesus. He had it during the time of Adam and the woman in the Garden of Eden. He'll have it during the millennial reign as well. It's his ministry to make the gospel understandable and for those who believe it, make it effective so that they are saved. And as you know, once saved, always saved. That's his ministry. These Pharisees who were claiming Jesus Christ was healing through Satan were abusing the ministry of God the Holy Spirit through him because his healing ministry that he was doing them, uh, do, doing right there, 
were the signs that he was God. He was the Messiah. He was the Savior. And they were the signs for who? Israel has promised to them. And yet they were rejecting it. Oh, he's of a demon. So when we boil it down, the doctrine of common and efficacious grace or the ministry uh, of uh, uh, the doctrine of efficacious grace is the ministry of God the Holy Spirit to take those who are helpless in the spiritual realm, which is unbelievers, which we all were at one point, to take that and make it effective for their salvation so that ultimately they can understand the gospel and they can be saved as well, all through the power of God. So it emphasizes the spiritual depravity and helplessness that we have as unbelievers because we can't do it on our own. But God the Holy Spirit can. And as the last point says, there's nothing that an unbeliever can do to save themselves. That's why, again, I hate religion. I hate Christian religion because they teach you, oh, do the cross, take communion, pray, give, do this, do that, do that, show up to church, and you'll be saved. Oh, yeah, there's Jesus in there too, okay? All right. But remember this, and again, you know, La Salette, Catholic Big organization down the street, okay? Get the lights during the Christmas time period. Bring the grandkids there. Have a great time. You go up a hill, there's a cross of Jesus Christ being crucified. Amen. Amen. Because even though they teach all the other garbage, that message is still there, okay? It's still there. And the ministry of God, the Holy Spirit, for the Catholic is to cut through the garbage and to get there if they want to believe it. And I know a lot of you have come from the Catholic Church because God the Holy Spirit convicted you of the truth of the Word. And so again, that's His ministry. And He does that for the spiritually dead person who has no opportunity to understand the things of God, can't understand the Bible, maybe intellectually they get it a little bit, but they don't understand the power of the Word of God in their life and what it means, and they can't because they don't have a spiritual discernment. They don't have a human spirit. So God, the Holy Spirit, acts as that spirit to make the gospel understandable for them. So their salvation, like our salvation and everyone's salvation, is accomplished by faith alone and Christ alone, the one thing that the Holy Spirit can do and make effective in the life of every unbeliever. But again, they have to also believe. They have to have the non-meritorious act of faith. Yeah, I believe that. And I recognize that I'm a sinner. I need a Savior. He's done it. Through Him I have salvation. And if you have that thought as an unbeliever, then God the Holy Spirit brings salvation to you, and you are saved. And again, religion comes in many different forms and sizes, but again, you'll hear the doctrine, invite Jesus into your heart. Walk the aisle and say the prayer, okay? You see, when you have that, walk the aisle, when you invite Jesus into your heart, it's all about what you're doing. And again, who are you to invite Jesus anywhere? You see, as an unbeliever, you need to hit your knees and say, I receive what you have done for me. See, we got to go there in faith. We're not inviting him to come here, Okay? And he is the one, again, there's a doctrine throughout the scriptures, the calling ministry of God the Holy Spirit, part of this common and efficacious grace. He's the one that invites us, and we accept his invitation. But it gets a little blasphemous when we are inviting Jesus into our heart. Okay? Not saying that people can't be saved that way. Come to faith and knowledge. You can't say, you know, don't want to say that either. Okay? But it gets it turned around. And it gets it out of the hands of God. And it gets it out of the realm of the Holy Spirit and His ministry throughout all of human history. So let's go to John chapter 16. Let's go to John 16 because this is the mechanics of the ministry of God the Holy Spirit. And in John chapter 16, verses uh, 8 through 11, Now, just back 
verse 7, give a little context. He says, but I tell you the truth. It is to your advantage that I go away. For if I do not go away, the helper shall not come to you. But if I go, I will send him to you. So again, talk about sending him to believers. Now in verse 8, and when he, excuse me, and he, when he comes, will convict the world concerning sin and righteousness and judgment. Concerning sin, because they do not believe in me. You see, th the message of salvation is the convicting ministry of God the Holy Spirit. And yes, common and efficacious grace is there, but there's an additional convicting to every member of the human race that they're a sinner and they need salvation. That's part of the common grace and the call and the ministry of the Holy Spirit. Really the convicting ministry, convicting the unbelieving world that they have sinned and they need a Savior. Then in verse 10, and concerning righteousness, because I go to the Father and you no longer behold me. And again, there's a lot, you know, chock uh, uh, full in that uh, passage there. But concerning righteousness, because I go to the Father, okay, and you do not see me. You see, no longer is the perfect righteous person of Jesus Christ here on earth to communicate and witness for himself. Now he's there with God the Holy Spirit. The righteous one is seated at the right hand of God the Father. And he's no longer in our world, as it were, in the physical flesh. So with him being absent physically, the Holy Spirit now shows us what true righteousness is all about. And really what salvation is. That your sins are forgiven. You've been washed clean. You've been made holy. Now you stand in the perfect righteousness of God. Because of the completed work of Jesus Christ. So that's what concerning righteousness is all about. A lot more detail behind that, but, you know, that's the gen general concept. In verse 11, and concerning judgment, because the ruler, and that's Satan, of this world has been judged. So again, God the Holy Spirit also convicts the unbeliever that there's a lake of fire waiting for them. There's eternal judgment waiting for them. And again, I've told you, you know, an uh, old friend of mine, uh, his father used to say, oh, oh, when you die, there's nothing after death. There's just you know, that hole in the ground, six feet down in the hole in the ground, and that's where you go, and that's it. Well, that's what you've convinced yourself that that's it. But during your life, the Holy Spirit has convicted you that there is an eternal lake of fire. There's an eternal judgment. That has already been handed out to Satan. We're just in the appeal trial of that right now. But that sentence will be fulfilled. And anyone who rejects Jesus Christ will also receive that same sentence because they've chosen that in their rejection of Jesus Christ. So all of this tells us of the ministry of the Holy Spirit under common and efficacious grace to convict regarding sin, to recognize that we're sinners, we need a Savior, concerning righteousness, that salvation and holiness and righteousness is only through Christ, who is now seated at the right hand of the Father, and then concerning judgment, because again, at the end of the time, we're all going to stand before the judgment seat of Jesus Christ. For the believer, in regard to our rewards. For the unbeliever, in regard to their works that will be shown not to be able to save them. And because they've rejected Jesus Christ, they are sentenced to the lake of fire. Now, in the New Testament, we see this blaspheming the Holy Spirit said in some different ways. In Acts chapter 7, verse 51, Stephen, in his last great message railing against the Pharisees, basically was saying, you men who are resisting the Holy Spirit. You see, they were resisting that message, the ministry of the Holy Spirit, telling them, teaching them, salvation through Christ. You're a sinner. You need salvation, righteousness, judgment. You need all of that. And the person of Christ is the one who gives you that. Believe in him. But they were resisting the Holy Spirit. It's another way of saying blaspheming the Holy Spirit. Then later on in Hebrews chapter 10, in verse 29, and, uh, it says, insulting the Spirit of grace. So you see common and efficacious grace. You see, those who are rejecting the gospel of Jesus are insulting the Holy Spirit. It's another form of blaspheming the Holy Spirit. And then prior to that, verse 26, it talks about willfully sinning. Again, willfully sinning. They're choosing to reject the ministry of God, the Holy Spirit, and remain in their sin. And so when we talk about the, the one thing that is not 
forgiven or the unforgivable sin, as it were. We also call this the unpardonable sin. And so whether it be blaspheming the Holy Spirit, resisting the Holy Spirit, or insulting the Spirit of grace, we see the unpardonable sin also mentioned in the tribulational time period, as Second Thessalonians prophesies about it. But we see it then in Revelation chapter 13 and 14 where even the Antichrist and the people of the world will be blaspheming Jesus Christ himself. And when they are talking about him not being the Savior, not being the Christ, they're blaspheming God the Holy Spirit and his ministry. <clears throat> and throughout the Bible and throughout all the ages of time, there's always been teaching and understanding about what it means to blaspheme God the Holy Spirit. As we look at the book of Acts, chapter 7, verse 51, you men are stiff-necked and uncircumcised in heart and ears, are always resisting the Holy Spirit. You are doing just as your fathers did. So again, resisting the Holy Spirit. Hebrews 10, 29, how much severe punishment do you think he will deserve who has trampled underfoot the Son of God? Again, that's another way of saying blaspheming the Holy Spirit. You're trampling underfoot the Son of God. What does that mean? You're running roughshod over Him. The message has been given to you. You've been convicted that you're a sinner. You need salvation. You know what the judgment is. You know where righteousness is in the person of Christ. But pff, you're just going to plow right over it. I'm just going to go about my way because I don't need that information. I'm going to live on my own. I'm going to do my own thing. Or I'm going to work for my own salvation. Again, trampled underfoot the Son of God, and is regarded as unclean the blood of the covenant, again, the cross of Jesus, by which he was sanctified and has insulted the Spirit of grace. Again, blaspheming God the Holy Spirit. So when we boil it all down, the essence of blaspheming the Holy Spirit isn't saying a bad word about him. Okay, It's denying the person of our Lord and Savior Jesus Christ, denying his convicting ministry. Again, going back to the context of blaspheming against Jesus, calling an, him had an unclean spirit, blaspheming Jesus Christ, where, again, we don't believe in him as the Savior, you're really blaspheming his ministry of common and efficacious grace by not believing that Jesus Christ is the Savior. And that's why our Lord gave us that discourse back in uh, the Gospel of Matthew and Mark, as we've read. You can blaspheme God the Father. You can blaspheme Jesus Christ. You can blaspheme His Word. But blaspheming against the Spirit is unforgivable. And basically, it's not saying a bad word against Him. It's saying, I don't believe in His common and efficacious grace ministry. I don't believe that Jesus is my Savior. That's what blaspheming God the Holy Spirit is. And that's why it's unforgivable. It's the only sin, as it were, that Jesus Christ could not pay for upon the cross. So, as the note says, again, tantamount to rejecting the person of Jesus Christ. It's unpardonable, it's unforgivable. And in fact, you know, we call it a sin, but it's more of an act than really a sin. But it still is a sin, okay? <laughs> but it's more of an act of what you think and how you reject Jesus Christ or the unbeliever does, and how they stonewall and, you know, trample underfoot and just, you know, run roughshod over them time and time again. I don't need Jesus. I don't need God. I don't need this. I don't need salvation. And again, trampling underfoot the Son of God is blaspheming the Holy Spirit, and that act is what's unforgivable. And the only thing that Jesus Christ could not pay for at the cross because it would be unjust and unrighteous is blaspheming the Holy Spirit. That's why it's an unforgivable sin. And remember, it's not saying a bad word about the Holy Spirit. It's rejecting the ministry, which is to teach about Christ, that He is your Savior, and salvation is only through Christ. So the sin can be committed by an un only by an unbeliever as well. Okay, So rest assured, believers, Okay, you can't commit the unpardonable sin. Okay, <laughs> And if you want, say bad things about the Holy Spirit. But please don't, okay? <laughs> All sins are forgiven. But the only thing that cannot be forgiven is unbelief and rejection of Jesus as our Savior. It's the only thing you couldn't pay for at the cross because, again, it would be unjust, unrighteous, 
because salvation is through him and through him alone. I am the way, the truth, and the life. No one comes to the Father but through me. Enter through the narrow gate. That's our Lord and Savior, Jesus Christ. There's only one way of salvation. Believe on the Lord and Savior, Jesus Christ, and you will be saved. And so when this act of unbelief is operational, it is always condemned, as John 3, uh, 18 speaks to. Let's just turn there real quick, and uh, then we'll uh, wrap up soon. So we're in John already. Just go back to chapter 3. John chapter 3, 18 comes after John 3, 16, which everybody knows. And I, and I love that, again, you, you know, go to football games or other sporting events, and somebody's holding up a sign, John 3, 16, okay? It's part of the convicting ministry of the Holy Spirit. It's right here, people, for the whole world to see, okay? And verse 16, For God so loved the world that he gave his only begotten Son, that whoever would believe upon him should not perish but have eternal life. Verse 17, for God did not send the Son into the world to judge the world, but that the world should be saved through him. Verse 18, he who believes in him is not judged. He who does not believe has been judged already because he has not believed in the name of the only begotten Son of God. So again, judged already. You see, we're born into this world under that judgment for the eternal lake of fire. And so if we continue our life in unbelief and reject the ministry of God, the Holy Spirit, blaspheme the Holy Spirit, we stay in that state of unbelief. And when we leave earth, then we will be sentenced to that lake of fire. But at any point in uh, any member of the human race's life, they can believe that Jesus died for their sins. And then they will be saved. And they will be uh, removed from that judgment. He who believes in him is not judged. Again, you escape that judgment of the eternal lake of fire. So again, it is impossible for the believer to commit the impartable sin because they have accepted Christ as their Savior. And as a result, your sins are blotted out. They're washed away. And in fact, even the unbeliever, when they stand before the judgment seat of Jesus Christ, their sins aren't brought up. The only sin that's brought up is that they didn't believe. Their works are judged, according to the Bible, not their sins. Their sins have already been judged at the cross. But for the believer, they receive the forgiveness of their sin as a result of their faith. Even in Old Testament, Isaiah 43 uh, 25, I, even I, am the one who wipes out your transgressions for my own sake, and I will not remember your sins. I remember your sins no more. The other passages talk about the washing of, uh, uh, clean of our sins, the wiping out, the blotting out, the removal of our sins. Jesus Christ paid for them upon the cross, and when we believe in him, we receive the payment of the forgiveness of those sins because they have been blotted out and as these people were blaspheming our lord and savior jesus christ at this time saying you're not the christ prophesied to us you know doubting his deity doubting who he was they were really blaspheming the holy spirit throughout all but yet he would pay for even their sins upon the cross except for the sin of blaspheming the holy spirit sins of abuse of hitting and beating the re the 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 uh rebuking of Jesus, saying bad things about him, those sins would be forgiven. But because they remained in unbelief, their sins would not, that sin would not be. But if they later came to believe, as you and I later came to believe in our lives, then those sins are all forgiven. And the judgment that comes with the rejection of the blaspheming of the Holy Spirit is removed. Let me just kind of go here. So though the believer can have sins of blaspheme forgiven, <laughs> remember, this isn't something we should entertain, okay? <laughs> so remember, blaspheming in the form of slandering, mocking, saying bad things about God and His Word or whatever the case may be, okay? 
they still are very uh, is, is a very egregious sin. It's still something we should not entertain. And to remind you how egregious this was, again, Luke 20, uh, excuse me, Le- Levitical, Leviticus, thank you, 24, 16, Moreover, the one who blasphemes the name of the Lord shall surely be put to death. All the congregations shall certainly stone him. So during the first two trials of our Lord and Savior Jesus Christ, we see this blasphemy, him being accused of blaspheming when it was a false accusation because he was God, filled with the Holy Spirit, doing his works in power by the Holy Spirit, bringing salvation to the world, yet they were the ones blaspheming against him. And even though they said disparaging words about our Lord and about God and his plan for salvation, whatever the case, those sins were forgiven. But yet the sin of unbelief cannot ever be forgiven. And as the physical and verbal abuse began with these trials, it's going to continue as we're going to see in the next section, especially when we get into Luke 23, as it continues under the Romans' hands as they too, not only the Jews, but now the Gentiles will be blaspheming Jesus Christ and rejecting him as their Savior and as their Messiah. So again, uh, blaspheming is a, a egregious sin that we should not be committing and entering into. But again, it pales in comparison to blaspheming the ministry of God, the Holy Spirit, which means rejecting Jesus as our Savior. And even if after our salvation we enter into rejection of Jesus Christ, remember, once saved, always saved. Even though you may rever- go into reversionism or apostasy or whatever the case may be, if you were saved at one point in your life because you truly believed in Jesus, that salvation stays with you for the rest of eternity. And you are forevermore saved. All right, let's close. Father, we thank you for this time. We thank you for your word. We thank you for your son, Jesus Christ, and his work upon the cross for the forgiveness of our sins. And we thank you for the convicting ministry of God, the Holy Spirit, coming into our lives individually and personally so that we have escaped judgment and have eternal life, and now salvation. And Father, we pray for all of those in our periphery who are unsaved, whether it be family or friends or co-workers, anyone that we're thinking about, Father, we pray for them that they too come to know your Son, Jesus Christ, and we ask that you use us as a vessel for the Holy Spirit to convict them with the gospel of Jesus Christ so that they too can come to salvation. So, Father, we pray for the closing portions of our service, and we pray uh, for our travels home this morning in Christ's name. Amen. All right, thank you very much. And uh, now I'll have Deacon Barry come forward. We'll take our Sunday morning offering. Well, we obviously made it through another month. Uh, although we did short pay the pastor again, and so that came out of our first offerings uh, of this month. So let us pray for our offering, Lord. We pray that you continue to keep your hand upon our congregation and bless us with gracious givers so that we may meet our financial obligations. In your word, the truth will continue to be taught from this pulpit. Through Christ we pray with the power of the Holy Spirit. Amen. Amen.